How about, uh, it's been a great conference, last talk of the day. I really enjoyed it. How about one more round of applause for these guys? Brian, <laughs> Francis, all these guys, Corey, Stephen. It's been a great conference. Thanks a lot. Um, so I know this is the Gotham Ruby conference. Um, what's on the screen here, this is not Ruby. This is actually a functional programming language um, called Haskell. Um, any Haskell programmers in the room today? I see a couple hands way in the back. Um, can anyone tell me what this code does? Anyone recognize this algorithm? Whoa, wow, perfect. Good job. This is the quick sort algorithm. So don't worry, I'm not going to explain this. I'm not going to expect you to understand this. So why am I showing this to you guys? Um, I think it's really important from time to time that all of us look at other programming languages um, and you know, learn from other languages once in a while. You know, we shouldn't always use Ruby every day and do the same things that we did the day before. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to learn much. You know, so there's a couple reasons why we should study other programming languages. That was the first one, really obvious. You know, if you push yourself out of your comfort zone a little bit, if you go climb a different learning curve for a while, you're going to learn a lot of new stuff really fast, really quickly. Um, there's another reason why I think you should learn other programming languages that's not quite as obvious. And to explain that, let me draw an analogy between computer programming languages you know, and real human languages. You know, whether it's Chinese or Greek or, in my case, Spanish, I think there's a lot of great reasons to learn a real human foreign language. Um, so I was lucky enough, I actually married a woman from Spain, and um, later in life I learned Spanish as an adult. It was one of the most rewarding, exciting things I've ever done. Um, and uh, so one, you know, one year we bring our kids over to, to Spain in the summer, so we spend time with our family. And we were there, I think we were there for a few weeks or even almost a couple of months one year. And I was getting really into it. I was talking Spanish 24-7, and none of her family speaks English. And I got really used to the staccato way they speak over there. And suddenly, I heard, you know, one day I heard English again. I must have been walking down the street, and I went by a tourist, or maybe I called home. or, you know, I heard English for the first time in like six or seven weeks. And it sounded a little different to me. I was like, whoa, what is that? I started to hear what an American English accent sounds like to foreigners, you know, to Spanish people at least. And I got to, you know, so another reason to study a foreign language is you get some perspective on your own language, you know, on your native language. You know, so this is a Ruby conference, so for us, our native language is Ruby, right? So if you go study another programming language for a while, when you come back to Ruby at your day job, it's probably going to seem a little different. It's going to look a little different than it did before, and maybe you'll use Ruby a little bit differently. Um, but where does Ruby come from in the first place? You know, this is, this is Matt, the founding father of Ruby, as we all know. You know, did he just wake up one day and decide, you know what, I'm going to create a new programming language this morning. It's going to do this, it's going to do that, it's going to do the other thing, and I'm going to call it Ruby. Um, you know, I don't think so. I'm not sure. Matt isn't here today. We could ask him. But um, I did a little bit of research, some Googling on this, and I came by a really interesting quote. This is from the Ruby Talk mailing list. This is from back in 2006, actually, so a lot of you may have seen this already. I'll give you a minute just to read through it. Um, but I thought it was really insightful because it gives us well, a lot of insight gives us, gives us some idea of where Matt's got the ideas from Ruby, uh, from the ideas for Ruby from. You know, he, he actually did what I was talking about before. He went out and he looked at other programming languages. So in this case, he mentions uh, take a simple Lisp language, add methods found in Smalltalk, add functionality found in Perl. So he actually looked at these other programming languages that, he, um, that, he, that were around at the time that he liked, and he pulled in different features that he wanted to use in his new language and he made this new combination that we all think, uh, that we know as Ruby today. Um, so, um, so if Matz was the founding father of Ruby, I think the guys who created these other three languages, Lisp, Smalltalk, and Perl, you know, maybe they're the founding grandfathers of Ruby, so to speak. You know, here's the first grandfather. This, this is Larry Wall. He created Perl in the late 1980s. Kind of seems like a long time ago now, but actually um, it was, wasn't too long ago. I don't know a lot about Perl. I've never actually used it uh, much, just here and there. I know a lot of Ruby's regular expression syntax comes out of Perl. Um, some of the more hands-on features that you know, get stuff done quickly. Um, another uh, founding grandfather might be Alan Kay. So he created Smalltalk back in the late 1960s. This is over 40 years ago. Um, if, if you haven't looked at Smalltalk before, you should definitely take a look at it. It's an amazing system. It has its own graphical user interface. It has uh, an integrated visual debugger. Um, and you know, this is in the 70s, right? This is cutting edge stuff at the time. Um, one of the amazing things I was reading about that Alan and his colleagues did was they took computers designed specifically for small talk, brought them into middle schools, and started teaching programming concepts to kids, you know, maybe for the first time. So the whole language was designed also for education, really cool 
Um, and Alan was a real visionary. He actually um, conceived of the idea of a laptop you know, in the 1970s, 15 or 20 years before there ever was a laptop built. And he called it something called a Dynabook, I think. But anyway, I was writing a blog post about Smalltalk about six months ago. And I came across this diagram in an academic paper I thought was really striking. I looked at this. I'm like, wow, Alan Kay is, right, is drawing a picture of how Ruby works. Right? This is the, you know, look at this. It has the internal class hierarchy of Ruby. We have the class class, the object class, integer class. But no, this is, the, if you can see the caption on the bottom, it says Smalltalk 76 metaphysics. So this diagram is almost 40 years old, and it's about a language that's not Ruby at all. It's actually Smalltalk. Um, so it's remarkable and striking to me how much of Ruby comes out of Smalltalk. You know, at its core, Ruby is really an object-oriented programming language. And all of us here, um, as Rubyists, are object-oriented programmers. Um, but there was one more language that Matt's mentioned in that quote that um, we need to look at. Wait, I've seen this picture before today. <laughs> Wait, this isn't the first thing. Wait, John McCarthy is behind everything going on here today, isn't he? So this is John McCarthy. He invented Lisp way back in the late 1950s. Um, if you don't know Lisp, if you want to learn more about it, you should check out this book. This is a classic um, land of Lisp, just a really entertaining read. Um, so Lisp is, of course, most famous for being the, maybe not the first, but the most influential and most important functional programming language. So invented in the 19, late 1950s, that paper that Mike mentioned earlier, I can't remember the name, it's you know, symbolic expression something part one, um, really defined the whole idea of functional programming. So this is my topic for today. I want to talk about you know, what functional programming is, um, you know, and can I do that with Ruby? Is Ruby also a functional language? And was Matt's, um, you know, what did Matt's actually take out of Lisp? So I'm not going to talk about Lisp. I want to talk about Haskell. Here's the original code. I had renamed earlier quicksort to be foo to try to trick you, but it didn't work. Um, but this is uh, what Haskell looks like. It's a really concise, um, very beautiful uh, language, actually. Um, and I didn't know much about Haskell. I just started studying this in the last few months. If you go out to haskell.org, there we go, um, you can read about Haskell. I didn't realize that Haskell is actually named after a 20th century mathematician. Uh, his name is Haskell Brooks Curry. Uh, and he studied uh, a branch of mathematics called lambda calculus. So lambda, the Greek letter, is also in mathematics means uh, function. And you know, that's where the word lambda keyword in Ruby comes from and also in Lisp. Um, so what is Haskell? Well, there it is. Pretty simple, right? It's a polymorphically, statically typed, lazy, purely functional language, whatever that means. You know, I don't know what that means. But whatever it is, it's certainly not Ruby. What is Ruby? Ruby is an object-oriented, dynamic, you know, language. So Ruby and Haskell are two very, very different things. And they don't, obviously, they don't have a lot in common, really nothing in common. But what I want to do today is I want to compare Ruby and Haskell and see really how different they are. Um, so here's the plan. I want to first take a, a couple minutes and just look at, okay, what is functional programming? So a lot of you probably do functional programming. Some of you might be experts in it. Um, but maybe some of you haven't heard of it before um, or not, aren't quite sure what it is. So let's just define that first, get on the same page. And then I'm going to talk about three patterns or techniques or um, you know, idioms that functional programmers like to use. And I'll first look at what they are. I'll try them out in Haskell. And then we'll go back to Ruby and see if we can do the same thing in Ruby. So those are higher order functions, lazy evaluation, and, and we'll finish up with memoization. And the last thing will be the yacht party. So we'll try to get out of here on time. So what is functional programming? OK, simple. Functional programming is just programming with functions. OK, no big deal. What is a function? If you think back to um, your seventh or eighth grade math class, you know, functions. OK, you, you take a number that have the domain, the range. You take a number x, it goes in the top, gets crunched around, goes around inside the function, comes out on the bottom, you get an answer, f of x. So the key idea behind functional programming is if you give a function, at least a pure function, if you give it the same input x, um, you always get the same output f of x. So the idea is that functions are independent of time. It doesn't matter when I call this function. It doesn't matter how many times I call it, or even if I call it a lot of different times at the same time in different threads. Um, I always get the same answer back. Um, and what this is good for, the reason that this is a good idea, is that in theory, at least, if you buy into the whole philosophy of functional programming, it helps you write better software. Right? You know, if I write this function once and I get the right answer, it's going to work forever. Um, if I build my whole application out of little functions, little building blocks of functions, and you chain them together into bigger functions, if they all return the same value, if they work the way they should, then I'm going to get better software that's more robust, more reliable, and has fewer bugs. 
Um, you know, and how is this possible? How can you possibly do this? The, the idea is that the code inside the function, there's no memory in there. There's no state. It has to give you the same answer back. There's no like, little database or variable in there that's changing. Um, and the code in the function is not allowed to reach out and change stuff outside of itself. So it, it can't have any side effects. Um, and the rest of your application is not around, allowed to reach in and poke inside the function. There really is a black box. So functions are very, actually very hard to do, very hard to write because of all these rules. But if you can do it, there's, in theory, at least a lot of real benefits to functional programming. Um, if you want to learn more about functional programming and, um, and you know, the reasons why you should try it and the philosophy behind functional programming, um, this is a great resource. So this is Rich Hickey. He's uh, you know, a super smart guy. He actually also invented a language called Clojure. Clojure, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that or even are using it. Clojure is a dialect of Lisp that runs on the Java virtual machine. Um, and, but, but beyond that, Rich Hickey is also a very charismatic, talented public speaker. So um, I haven't seen him in person, but if you check out his videos online, they're amazing. He goes through you know, all kinds of really deep thought and philosophy around you know, state and time and data and you know, looking at your data in a time-independent way and kind of looking at the world in a different way. It's really profound stuff and also very well explained. So check that out. This is a good one here um, to start with. Are we there yet? But there's a lot of other presentations as well. Um, now what I want to do today is, um, is you know, get away from the philosophy. I want to go back into sort of more um, hands-on stuff and get down to some code. So we'll start with higher order functions. So before we get to that, let's look at, um, so again, I'm going to show you a series of slides. Um, on the top, you can see I have Haskell with the, the Haskell gray lambda icon. And on the bottom, I have some Ruby code. Um, the first thing is, uh, the first thing about functional languages like Haskell is they often have a data type called a list. And in Haskell, you can create a list. You just say square brackets, you know, one comma, two comma, three, just comma separated values. Pretty simple. There's also a shorthand. You can say one dot dot 10, and you get a list one to 10. In Ruby, I can do the same thing, right? I can actually, I'd probably use a range. So I could do the one dot dot syntax. It looks very similar. Um, but in Ruby, we don't have lists. You know, we don't have linked lists that are native to the language. So in Ruby, we would probably use an array instead. So I can convert um, you know, the range in parentheses dot 2a gives me an array. But I get the same answer. It works just fine. So you know, at first glance, actually, Haskell and Ruby look somewhat similar. Let's say I want to do a little more. Let's say I want to calculate the first 10 squares. Okay, So you know, 1, 4, 9, 16, et cetera, et cetera. So you guys can probably write this code in five seconds or less in Ruby. right? So on the second line in Ruby, we have you know, 1 to 10 is a range dot collect or dot map either way, you know, two names for the same function. Um, and then you pass in a block, x, x times x. So there we go, bang, 1 to 10, I square each one, I get the right answer. I get an array 1, 4, 9, up to 100. So in Haskell, I can do exactly the same thing, except I write it in a little bit of a different way. I go from right to left instead of left to right. So in Haskell, I would say, I want a list, this is the square bracket, of x times x, where x comes from the list 1 to 10. So it's kind of just you know, the opposite order. But it works almost the same way. Um, so once again, you can see that Haskell and Ruby are kind of similar. There's a lot of similarities going on here, despite the fact they're from you know, completely different places. So, um, so higher order functions. What are higher order functions? And actually, what I just showed you was an example of a higher order function. So a higher order function is a function, a special function, that you know, doesn't take a simple value x. So x might be a, a number or a string. But for higher order functions, x is actually another function. So a higher order function takes a function as input and returns a second, maybe different function as output. Uh, and there's some magic going on in there that works on functions. So how is it that I was using higher order functions in the previous example? So if we take a look, another look at that, and what I've done here is actually I've rewritten it to be more confusing and verbose. But at least it shows, it shows more clearly that I'm passing a function into the math method. All right, so let's look at the second line, the Ruby here. I have uh, you know, 1 to 10, again, a map just like before. But now I have ampersand lambda. So it's kind of wacky. But ampersand lambda converts the lambda into a block or into a proc. So I can use it this way. But again, lambda, back to lambda calculus. Lambda means function. So here I have, I'm saying, take a function that takes x as an argument and returns x times x. And then pass that in as a parameter to map. And then operate on the range in this case. So actually, now we're seeing the map method is actually a higher order function. So you know, on the top, what about Haskell? I can say, actually, Haskell has the same function that Ruby does called map. So in Haskell, I would say map. And then I have parentheses. And inside there, it's a little confusing. You just say backslash x, 
right arrow x times x. Okay, so that's how I, that's how I write a lambda in Haskell. Um, and so here's how that map function works. So it takes the lambda as an argument, so it's a higher order function, takes a, la a function as an argument, returns a second function as a return value, which then operates that second function. You might, wanna, you might call that the squaring function. That operates on the list 1 to 10. Bam, we get all the right answers. So we're seeing, again, both languages. Haskell is, is a little more elegant than Ruby, but um, both languages can do higher order functions like this. Um, and curiously, if you use the, the Ruby 1.9 syntax for lambda, it's actually a right arrow. So it e looks even more similar to, to Haskell. Um, so this gets me to the question of you know, how functional programmers think and why you would want to use higher order functions. But let's start with you know, how object-oriented programmers think. So we're all object-oriented programmers. We use Ruby. So we think of the world, if you think of a problem that you're trying to solve, you think of it in terms of objects. You know, so you're an object, and you're an object, and I'm calling your method. You return a value to me, and I'm calling you. You're another object. I call your method, and your state changes because something goes on inside you. Um, but functional programmers, they think in a little bit of a different way. So they think in terms of their data. You know, their data, where does the data go? Where does it come from? Imagine, you know, their data is a series of widgets or something, some kind of thing in a factory, and there's a series of machines operating on it. Those are the functions. You know, to see what I mean, take a look at a more complicated example in Haskell. Let's suppose I have, um, let's suppose I want to calculate x squared plus 1. So it's kind of silly. You know, I could have just said x squared plus 1 in the previous example. But let's say I want to do that in two steps. You know, I, I start on the right with 1 to 10. I get x. I put that through x times x. And then I go again in a second step through another function, x plus 1. So here you can see the style of how you know, your data kind of goes from one place through a series of functions to another place. Um, and, and bam, it works fine. 2, 5, 10, 17, 26. So um, how would I do that in Ruby? It would work the same way, right? Well, actually, one more thing about Haskell. In Haskell, when you look at that, how it works on the inside, it actually passes each number through the functions one at a time. So it's kind of a curious but important detail here. You know, so the 1 goes through 1, 2 into the result list. The 2 goes through 4, 5 into the result list. The 3 goes through 9, 10, et cetera. Now let's take a look at Ruby. How would I write this in Ruby? Um, so, well, as you probably know, you can just chain these collects together in the same way. And probably a lot of you written code like this before as well. 1 to 10 collect x squared, um, and 1 to 10 collect, or, or collect x plus 1. So bam, I get the same answer. But let's take a look inside of Ruby, you know, because I think it's really interesting to look at um, Ruby internals. How does the language work on the inside? Because it gives you a lot of insight into what's actually going on. It gets you to understand how Ruby works, and you get to use Ruby a little bit better and more confidently. Um, so in this example, what is the collect method? So if we looked at, um, well, some of you probably know, the collect is, a, collect is a method on the enumerable object. And I could have used map. Map and collect are the same thing again. Um, and the, enum the enumerable module, I'm sorry, enum the enumerable module is actually mixed in or included into a lot of different Ruby classes. So in this case, the range that we were using, or could have been the array class or uh, many other classes. Um, and the enumerable module is really cool. I like to think of the enumerable module as sort of a series of machines that you can use to process data like this. You know, like a heavy, heavy equipment at a construction site. You know, my data might be the rocks and the dirt I'm trying to push around. And then the enumerable module has all these different methods I can use to do that with. You know, we have select, or any, or reject, and there's like 10 or 15 other ones, and collect and map are two of them. And what they all do internally is they all call each on the target, on the receiver. So when I said range.collect, what collect does, it turns around and calls each on the range. So the enumerable module, you can think of it sort of as a fancy way, you know, 15 fancy ways of calling each on something. Um, and so back to my example, when I call each on the range, I have 1 to 10, collect x squared. What does this do? So we start on the left. We call each on the range. This does an iteration 1 to 10. It starts passing these numbers back. So inside of Ruby, and it's inside the C code. I'm not going to show any C code today. But there's a function in there um, called collect underscore i. And what that does, it just takes a number. And since it's collect, it passes it out to my block. It yields it to my block, or just calls my block and gives it the, dum the number. My block will do the x squared, and it returns it back, puts it in the result array. So pretty simple. If I wanted to implement collect myself in Ruby, it wouldn't be that hard. Right? I could probably define it uh, just like this. Um, I think the Rubinius code looks very similar to this. I just wrote this up myself with, a, you know, with range as an example. So I would say you know, depth, collect, range, and then block. So um, I'm pa passing the target object, the range, pass in a block. This is the, um, the, the function that I want to um, process the data with. So again, this is a higher order function because I'm passing in a function as a parameter here. 
Uh, and it's pretty simple. So the result would be a, a new empty array. Uh, then we would call each on the range. OK, just like I said, we're calling each on the target object. Take each number out of the range. Call the block, the provided block with that number. And take the result, push it onto the result array. So pretty simple. Then we just return that at the end. So but one important thing about this is that it's eager. OK, this is the fancy buzzword for, this, for the way this process works in Ruby. OK, so on the left, we start 1 to 10 f of x is x of x, x times x, and we get to one, 1 to 100. So the, what it does, since it iterates over the entire range, it processes all 10 of those numbers in one step. So 1, 2, 3, they all go through the first function as a big chunk, and they end up in a new temporary array in the middle, 1 to 100. And then when that's finally done, we call step 2. We iterate through 1 to 100, and we add 1. So Ruby works in this, um, in this eager fashion and processes all the data in two big steps. And if you remember a few minutes ago, I was saying Haskell actually passes them in one at a time. So enough about that. Let's move on to um, lazy evaluation. So this is uh, a little different. OK, so what is lazy evaluation? So before I get to that, I want to talk about um, another concept, something called an infinite list. Um, so in Haskell, you remember I was saying 1.10? Dot dot I can actually say one dot dot, take off the 10, and I just get an infinite list of numbers. So Haskell's returning to me all the numbers in the universe. If I type this into the Haskell REPL, it actually starts to spit out all the numbers at me. I need to hit Control C after a few thousand. So why would you want to use this? What is this good for? So well, you can do some cool things. Like I can say, well, just take 10 of the, of the infinite list, and I get, bam, 1 through 10. So Haskell knows I just want 1, 2, 3 up to 10, and I don't want 11 or 12 or 13. It stops there. Again, it's kind of interesting, but not really useful. But what you can do is you can start to use these infinite lists in more complicated formulas. So here's the x squared plus 1 example again. So here I have you know, 1 dot dot, pass that through x times x, through x plus 1, and then take, just take 10 of those. So somehow Haskell is able to figure out, even after all of this code is running, that I only want 10 values. And this could have been a much more complex example with many different you know, functions going on here. But it works just fine. I get 2, 5, 10, bam, up to 101. It just works. So Haskell is a, what, that, what they said earlier on the Haskell.org site, it's a lazy language. Laziness is built in um, into the language itself. So the word lazy means it doesn't actually calculate these values until, you, until it actually needs to. It defers the evaluation as long as possible. So what about Ruby? Can we do this in Ruby? So this year, in the new version of Ruby, Ruby 2.0, actually has a new feature in it called the lazy enumerator. Um, so here's how you can use it. So it, just like Haskell, just a little bit more typing, a little bit more verbose. Um, so you have to say one dot dot float colon colon infinity. So that's a special constant. In Haskell, I can just leave it off. In Ruby, I have to type in this thing. Um, and then in Ruby, I have to say dot lazy. Okay, it's not lazy by default. Remember, it's eager by default. So in Ruby, I can say okay dot lazy. All right, fine. And then I can say collect x squared, collect x plus one. And then I have to say okay take ten. That's just like Haskell, actually, very similar. And actually, at the end, you have to say dot force, sort of get this, get this thing going and trigger it. Um, if you want to save some typing, you can just say dot first 10, and it works fine. But this is great. Once again, we're seeing a lot of similarities between Haskell and Ruby. Both of them can do lazy evaluation. I get the same answer, and it's also lazy. It doesn't evaluate these things until it actually needs to. Um, so how does this work on the inside? I'm kind of fascinated by this. Again, you know, lazy evaluation seems like magic. How does a language know whether or not to evaluate something until the last moment? Um, so I have no idea how Haskell works internally. It would be fun to study that. But we can look at how Ruby works. So before we get to um, lazy evaluation, we first need to learn about the enumerator object. So again, a lot of you probably know what the enumerator objects are. You might use them in your own code. They're super cool objects. What they do is they provide data that you can then pass into these chains of functions. You know, and this, this example I have, you know, yield one, yield two. So this is really super simple. Again, I like to make things simple. We can fit them on one slide and understand them. But you can actually generate you know, complex objects and you know, complex data values here, too. So the way you do this is you say enumerator new just creates a new enumerator. And you pass it a block. Um, and then you yield out the data values that you want to yield out. So I have one and two. So as an example, if I say you know, p enum collect x squared, what do I get? I get one, four. So it's squaring one is squaring two. So pretty simple. It's kind of weird, though. If you look at this, somehow the values from the block that I'm passing into the new enumerator are somehow you know, magically passed into this other block down here. Um, and that's, um, that's kind of weird. Ruby doesn't normally let you do that sort of thing. You can't just take 
values out of one block and they show up in another block. So there's actually a trick going on here. This little y value, the y being passed into the block in the constructor, that's actually an instance of something called a yielder object. So again, if we start to look inside of Ruby and learn about how things work internally, um, there's kind of some weird stuff going on in there. But what you do is you, we're not actually yielding. This is not a real yield. We're not yielding values out of the enumerator's block. We're calling a method called yield on the yielder object. Um, and then the yielder object magically passes those into this block over here. You know, so how does that work? If we look, again, look inside of Ruby and we start reading the C source code, I'm summarizing what's going on in there with these diagrams. So inside the enumerator object, there are two, actually two different objects. One is the yielder, we just saw that. There's something else called a generator. Okay, so a generator is another sort of internal hidden Ruby class implemented with C code that, um, well, what it does, it tucks, it, it, it stashes away that block that I provided earlier. It stores it actually as an, internally as a proc. And then every time I need something from the enumerator, for example, if I called each on the enumerator, like in my previous example, the enumerator would call that generator and say, hey, I need a new value, give me a value. This would yield it out to the, he would call the yielder and that would yield it out to the chain of functions that I'm about to use. So cool, we're learning more about how Ruby works internally. So what's nice about the enumerators is that you can chain them up with enumerables. Okay, so I have over here an enumerable collect method. Um, so remember when I called that, it calls each on the target object. If that target object was an enumerator, then it would um, yield a value back to me. Okay, and then this thing would yield it, since it's a collect, it yields it down to the block that I provide, you know, x squared or x plus one or whatever. So these things are designed to work together, they're kind of cool. Now lazy evaluation, how does that work? Um, so to make lazy evaluation work, or lazy enumeration, what the Ruby core team did in Ruby 2.0 is they added this new internal object called the enumerator lazy, or a lazy enumerator. So it's, a, it's a, another new internal uh, Ruby class implemented with C code. And what it does, it plays both roles. So it does both calls each on the target, and then it yields back a value. So what's cool about that is I can chain these things together, and they'll, um, they'll work together you know, perfectly. And so if I, if I kick off the process, they'll you know, call each, 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 and then yield things back. So let's take a look at how that works. So here's my example again. Um, uh, so this was you know, one to infinity, so I have an infinite list of numbers, okay? But I don't, want to, I don't want to evaluate all of them. If you ran this in Ruby 1.9 or earlier, it would just hang, it would go on forever. So I want that to be lazy, I want to run both of the blocks, and then I just want the first 10 values at the end. So how does that work internally? So the first 10, that code on the right, triggers the whole operation. It's, so it's, that, it's the code at the end, this is kind of an interesting and important thing about lazy evaluation is, the code at the end of your calculation controls the execution. It tells it when to start and when to stop. So, it's, so when I call first 10, it triggers the whole process. And that calls each on each of these lazy enumerators. And they go back up to the parent object, or the target, which is, in this case, the infinite range. And that says, oh, you're calling range.each? Okay, fine. So I'll start iterating over all the numbers. I'm an infinite range, so I'm, you know, one to infinity, so it'll just one, two, three, four. It'll start spitting these numbers out. Now the way these lazy enumerators work is they get one number, and they immediately yield it to my block. So the x times x, so the, the one comes in, I get one times one, I get a one, and that goes back up. Now the key, the key detail is it immediately yields it to the next one. And this one catches it and says, okay, pass it to this block, one plus one is two. And then the two goes in, and the first 10 starts collecting these values. Then when it's done, the two comes out. Okay, and the two goes in here, it gets yielded out, two times two is four. Up, and then go over, two plus one is five. And that gets collected over here by the first 10. So we start to see the same behavior we saw with Haskell, okay? So the, the values come out of the range one at a time. And then they get, they get saved in an array only at the very end. There's no intermediate array in the middle. Um, and of course, the first 10 method, well, that, that actually knows I want 10 values. I don't want you know, an infinite list. I don't want seven values, I want 10. So when it gets to 10, it says, okay, we're done, stop. I don't want any more. So again, the code at the end of the calculation controls the whole execution of your program. So kind of interesting. Um, and again, we're seeing more similarities between Ruby and Haskell. The more we look, the more they're similar. All right, so we're getting towards the end. Memoization. What does memoization mean? Well, actually, it's just a fancy word for, for caching, right? So a lot of you probably you do memoization already in your Ruby code with the, the or or equals operator. So how do we do that um, in a functional programming language? 
So before we get to that, I want to talk about an example where we might need memoization. We might need caching. So this is, this is an example of calculating the Fibonacci sequence. OK, so you probably all heard of this. Most of you probably know what the Fibonacci sequence is. It's just a sequence of integers where you know, each value is the sum of the two previous ones. So 5 is 2 plus 3, thir uh, 8 is 3 plus 5, 13 is 5 plus 8, et cetera, et cetera. So to calculate that in Haskell, you can use this really kind of beautiful, elegant code. You know, one of the nice things I like about Haskell is the way you can define, you can sort of repeatedly define functions like this and give it different uh, per, you know, patterns of arguments. So I can say, OK, slow fib, by the way, it's called the slow fib function because it's really slow. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so the slow fib of 0 is 0. So if, if I call this with a 0, it returns 0. Slow fib of 1 is 1. If I call it with 1, it returns a 1. OK, that's simple. And then there's like a catch-all at the bottom. Slow fib of n is slow fib of n minus 2 plus slow fib of n minus 1. So it's pretty simple. It's not Ruby, but it's pretty simple to understand. So it's a recursive formula to figure out the nth value. You have to calculate the two before and add them together. But this is the slow fib function. This is really slow. Who can tell me why this is slow? This is sort of a textbook example of recur recursion problems. Anyone know? We're do sorry? Say again? Re recalling it, right. Recalling it. So, so like, say I calculate, I call slow fib of 50. It has to say slow fib of 48 plus slow fib of 49. Then I have to calculate slow fib of 49. So it has to say slow fib of 47 plus slow fib of 48. So now I've calculated 48 twice. So, um, so as, I, as I call higher and higher numbers, this blows up in this like, exponential pattern, this pyramid of like, unnecessary uh, recursion. So it blows up. So it's really fast 1 to 10, and it's really fast. So I say map slow fib to 1 to 10. And it works, bam, works really fast. If I, if I pass in 50, it's really slow. I think, I don't remember, but if I pass in 100, you know, it takes like hours or days to figure this out. So how do we fix this? How do we fix um, unnecessary recursion like this? It's kind of like, you know, think back to college, sort of classic textbook example. Well, we use caching, right? So back to functional programming. I don't need, so what I said earlier was, if I call a, a pure function with the number x, it always returns the same value f of x as a result. So another nice thing about this, beyond just working better or having fewer bugs, is that I can use caching. It's very natural and easy to do caching in a functional language, right? If this always returns the same value, I don't need to call it more than once. So if I call fib of 49 once and I figure it out, I'm done. So it should be really easy to do caching and memoization in a functional language. So let's take a look at how would I do, how would I rewrite this function in Haskell to do caching properly? Well, here's what a Haskell programmer would do. They would, use, um, they would use typical Haskell magic, OK? This sort of blew my mind when I saw this example for the first time. I didn't write this. This comes from the Haskell site. Th this is how they do it. They say, memoize fib is parentheses map fib 0 dot dot bang bang. What? What the heck does that mean? <laughs> this is, so this is the problem. Functional programming sounds great, but it's actually really hard stuff, especially Haskell. I think there's some other you know, languages that might be a little easier to get your head around. Haskell is probably the toughest one. But it's also the, sort of the most elegant and beautiful one in a lot of ways. All right, so let's hold on to that thought. We'll, we'll get to the memo. We'll get to the first line on the next slide. Let's look at the rest of this um, function. How does this work? So there's another neat, neat feature of Haskell, similar to Lisp and other languages. You can say where, and then you can define another uh, function in lines, and then use that in the previous code. So I can say where fib of zero is zero. So this is the same thing we saw before, where fib of 1, 1, one is 1, and fib of n is me the memoized, the cached one, of n minus 2 plus n minus 1. So that's pretty cool. OK, so back to the magical line. Like, what the heck's going on there? How does this work? Can we use this, um, can we understand this magic? I'm out of range here. Here we go. Um, so let's break this down. So here's how functional programmers think. I think this is bizarre, but this is the way functional programmers think. And no, no offense if any of you are doing this already. So they say to themselves, all right, I need to cache the Fibonacci sequence. So what do I need to do? It's simple. I just have to create an infinite list of imaginary Fibonacci numbers, and I'm done. And that's my cache. So what they do is they say, OK, map the Fibonacci function to an infinite list, and I'm done. Like, this, is, this list here, this is the infinite list 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you know, et cetera. So if I map, this is like collect, if I map the Fib function to that list, you know, what do I get? I get all the Fibonacci numbers. 
in, in this infinite sort of imaginary list that's lazily evaluated. But whatever, it's a, real, it's a list of numbers that has all the answers in it. So this is how functional programmers think. This is how they use infinite lists and lazy evaluation. And okay, and then what is this sort of, this business here on the right, the bang bang, what's that all about? So this is another, um, uh, it was very unusual, but once you, once you understand what this operator means, it's not that hard to figure out. So this is the index of or a ref operator. So bang bang means take the list on the left, take an index on the right, and give me the nth element of that list. Oop, 10 minutes, all right, no problem. So, um, but the trick here is we're not actually providing n here. We're just saying uh, list bang bang. So, you know, what's going on here? So that's actually another example of another functional technique called curried functions. And I think this is probably also named after Haskell Curry, the mathematician guy. Um, so let's take a look at this. So what I want to do to explain this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show that how this works in Haskell, and then I'm going to try to implement it in Ruby for two reasons. One is I want to see if I can do this sort of thing in Ruby, and two is the Ruby will help us understand how all this magical Haskell code actually works. OK, so let's go through it. So starting with the infinite list. So in Haskell, I just say 0 dot dot, and I get infinite list of numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, no problem. Ruby 2.0, I can do the same thing, 0 up to float, colon, colon, infinity. Works just as well, T slightly more uh, typing. So things get um, a little more verbose, though. Okay, So here, in Haskell, I'm calculating this cache of Fibonacci numbers. So I just have to say map fib to this infinite list. And I'm done. Bam, I have all the answers already done. There they are. Can I do that in Ruby? So in Ruby, I have 0 dot dot float infinity. And then I have to say, OK, dot lazy, dot map, race. I have to pass in a block. So a lot more typing, but the same idea. right? I can take an infinite range. I can make it lazy. And then I can map it to a function. I'm not showing the fib function of Ruby, but it's the same idea. All right, now let's do the bang bang operator. Let's see how that works. OK, whoa. This is getting really verbose and complicated. But this is a good chance to walk through this and explain it. So on the top, I have that curried function that we saw earlier. What does, this, what does this mean in Ruby? So in Ruby, I take a cache. So I create a variable cache. This is my lazy infinite list of answers. So I'm going to save that in this variable. Then I'm going to create another function called nth element from list. So this is sort of the, Ruby, the generic Ruby way of, of writing a function for that bang bang operator. So this means I'm going to create a function, a lambda, that will take two parameters, an array and an index n, and it will return array of n. So that's pretty simple. That's what, this is what the bang bang does. And I'm not going to run this. I'm going to make a lambda that does this and save that in a variable, nth element from list. Then, OK, I don't want an nth element from any list, though. I want nth element from the Fibonacci sequence. So I can do that in Ruby by saying, OK, the nth element of the Fibonacci sequence is just the nth element from the list dot curry, so I can do curried functions in Ruby, it turns out. This is a method on the proc class. So I just, I provided one of the two arguments, but not both of them. And what dot curry will do, just like in Haskell, it will take the lambda, pass in or tuck away this one argument, and return me a new function or a new lambda, which is waiting and ready to take the other argument, which is the n. So now I have a function that returns the n Fibonacci in the sequence. Perfect. So like I'm doing functional programming with Ruby. This is pretty cool. It's a lot more typing. It's a lot more messy. But it actually, it, it does the same thing. So let's try it out. Let's run it. So in Haskell, I run it. I get map, memoize, fib, 1 to 10. Bam, I get the right answer. Super fast. What happens if I run it in Ruby? I get an error. I get block in main, undefined method, square brackets for numerator, lazy, numerator, lazy, 0 to infinity, map, no method error. OK. What does that mean? Like, what's gone wrong? You know, our, our beautiful world of functional programming has been shattered. Something has gone wrong here. What is it? OK, so the problem is um, when, I call the, when I call this nth element from list function. OK, so I have, I passed in the array, I passed in n, but the array was not an array, was it? What, was, what is it that I passed into nth element from list? Well, it was that lazy, that chain of lazy um, enumerators. And so um, then I called square brackets on that, but it wasn't an array. It wasn't a list. So what happened? It gave me this error, um, you know, no method error. There is no square brackets method on that, on this lazy enumerator object. So the problem is, in Ruby 2.0, the lazy enumerator is not a real lazy evaluation solution the way that it is in Haskell. So Haskell was designed from the ground up to do lazy evaluation of all of its functions. You can do lazy evaluation with any function in Haskell. In Ruby, I can only do it with iterations, with each, because internally, this collect method 
and the, and the lazy equivalent, they're all calling each. So it only works in this enumeration style. Now that's not to say it's, it's a horrible thing, it's worthless. There's a lot of great ways to use lazy enumeration in Ruby. You can control processes that you're not sure when they should end and that sort of thing. But it's not quite as elegant and robust as it is in Haskell. Um, and if, you know, just to, you know, a little wrap up here, if we wanted to do this sort of Fibonacci in Ruby, well, you can do it in a more object-oriented way. You just say, okay, I'm going to create a cache the old-fashioned way with a hash object, and I'm going to save the numbers in there, and I'm going to use our good old or or equals operator to either, you know, get the new one or get it out of the cache if it was already there. So this is a more, you know, idiomatic Ruby object-oriented solution. So that still works. So the nice thing about Ruby is you can choose, I can either do object-oriented programming or I can try out some of these functional ideas, and I can do them both. All right, so what have we learned today? So my main message is take some time out of your life and study other languages. You know, human languages as well, but at least for programming, um, you can learn a lot by doing that. that. Those are the times when you learn the most, when you try something new. And also because when you come back to Ruby, you'll have a different perspective on it and will seem a little different to you. And you might use Ruby a little differently. Um, and, you know, what I just said. So Ruby has a lot of functional features. What Matt said is really true about, um, about where Ruby came from. He did pull a lot of things out of Lisp. You know, my favorite feature in Ruby is actually, are actually blocks. I think they're a really beautiful, elegant way of passing functions into other functions. And that came right out of, um, of Lisp. Um, but it's not a pure functional language in the sense that Haskell is. So, you know, keep that in mind if you're going to try this stuff out. So that's all I got. Um, this is my book. If you want to learn more about Ruby internals, check this out online, Ruby Under a Microscope. And I'm actually working on rewriting this this year for uh, a publisher and have a real print, print, print version in the fall. So that's it. And I think we've got a few minutes for questions. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks.